We are in week five, I believe, of our series on um, growing spiritually. We're calling it woke yet. And I don't let that alarm you. Uh, however you use the word woke, we're probably using it a little differently. The word woke that we are using when we say woke yet, I mean, are you spiritually awake? Are you alive in Christ? Are you growing? Remember back when we talked in January, um, which seems like a long time ago, but reality it's only what, just two months ago. Um, we ask, or I ask you, um, do you have a plan for growing this year? Do you have a plan to be a different person at the end of the year than you are right now? Are you happy with the person you are? Or do you think there may be some improvements you might make? Do you want to be more like Jesus? Almost everybody raised their hand and said, yeah, I want to be more like Jesus. When I said, how are you going to do it? Well, I know I keep bringing this up, but not very many of you raised your hands. It takes a little bit of intentionality. Um, some people say they don't really have motivation. I lack motivation. Sometimes it's hard, but let me just tell you that if you don't have motivation, one of the greatest secrets in life is you don't need motivation if you have discipline. And discipline is something you can choose to have. Motivation comes and goes. But I believe now that since we're two months in to the new year that you probably have grown a little bit, right? You have um, probably made some advances physically uh, you know, maybe you're still sticking to your diet. Maybe you're moving a little bit, exercising. Maybe you're fay- paying attention to your relationships. Your marriage is a little better if you're married, your parenting, your friendships. Um, I believe that if you've applied some of these things that we've talked about to your life over the last few weeks, you're growing spiritually. If you remember two weeks ago, we talked about prayer and introducing simply five minutes of prayer per day into your life. It's just a start. It's not the, you know, the ultimate goal as far as, you know, your prayer life, but it's a place to start. We talked about the Lord's prayer and we talked about the second time that Jesus gave the instructions to the disciples on how to pray. And I gave you a little template and um, sent you off to pray. And many of you did that because you told me about it. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you did or didn't do that. Many online did that because we had a bunch of people download the template, which is great because because people are saying, yeah, I want to make an effort to start to grow. Last week, we talked about studying scripture or um, just thinking through some passages. And I gave you six different verses or short passages of scripture and uh, another little template that you could use from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And so you guys took a verse or a couple of verses. You went through and asked yourself some questions each day over the last six days. And I know that many of you did that. Some of you posted it online, which by the way, if you're making Facebook posts, I think that's one of the very best things you could possibly post is scripture, right? Right? Uh, sometimes our Facebook and social media gets us in trouble. They know we are Christians by our love, right? It's not the truth we stand for. It's the way we stand for the truth sometimes that drives people away from who Jesus is. But let's just say that you're doing these two things and you're growing. Now, perhaps you've gotten a little proud. You've got a few weeks under your belt. You're looking at all those uh, other people who aren't doing it yet. Maybe it's your spouse or somebody who you know, and you're like, hey, did you read your Bible today? And they said, not yet. And you look down on them a little bit because unfortunately, Human nature drives us to compare. We want to compare ourselves to other people. We want to feel better than other people. And I want to talk to you today about the anecdote from self-centeredness. I'm going to talk to you about the anecdote of pride. The biggest, I mean, weapon the enemy uses against us in our lives is pride. It's the sin that caused Satan to be cast from heaven. It's the sin that caused Adam and Eve to be cast from the garden. And it's the sin that separates you and I from a right relationship with Jesus, the sin of pride. And today we're gonna talk about the anecdote to that. It is your next step in your simple steps to spiritual growth. You do a few things that you may or may not wanna do every day and you do them consistently and over time you grow. And this is the third step. Are you ready for it? Oh my goodness, you guys sound so ready for it. I'll just tell you a little secret. In the service before you guys, um, it was a sleepy service, right? I mean, it's a beautiful day here in Iowa and we're due, right? The wind's a little, you know, that's that's Iowa. And people were a little sleepy. And so I was going for about five minutes and I said, okay, let's pray. Because I wanted to pray for them to wake them up, right? Sometimes you just pray and it's like, man, God, you got to wake us up because this is way too important to miss. And so I'm praying. And that's the cue for the worship team to come out when I pray, because usually it's the end of the section. So I was only five minutes done. And I look over at Ashley and Daniel and the worship team standing there and I'm like, what are you guys doing? So it was really interesting. Um, but I mean, it's one of those mornings. So there's a battle for your attention, right? And, and I want you guys to be focused because this is way too important for you not to catch. I want you to miss it or not miss it. You got it? So um, I want us all together and, and focused because you can grow and you can be different today. Uh, but this is gonna stretch you a little bit relationally and um, organizationally a little bit. And I just am excited to see if you want to do it or if you just think I'm nuts. 
We'll talk about that later. We're talking about serving. And we're not talking about something specifically that you do once in a while, that's important. But we're talking about cultivating an attitude of service, viewing the world like Jesus viewed the world. In Philippians 2, the apostle Paul says that in everything, we're not supposed to be selfish or vain. Rather, in humility, we value others above ourselves, not looking to our own interests, but looking to the interest of others. And then he says, in all of our relationships, in every relationship, the ones who are around you, the ones who are closest to you, the relationships that you have, he says, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Now, that seems like the most churchy and unrealistic thing anybody could ever say to me. Just be like Jesus in all of your relationships and things will be fine. Of course, right? But I'm not Jesus. I'm sinful. I'm selfish. I wake up in the morning self-absorbed, thinking about my schedule, my calendar, my goals, how I feel and what I want. So how in the world am I supposed to be like Jesus? Sometimes I don't even want to be like Jesus. But you don't have to stay motivated if you stay disciplined. And remember week number one when we were together? The Holy Spirit of God changes you and changes the way you think. Will change you from the inside out, creating in you a new person. And this is a way for you to put yourself in that current of the spirit that we've talked about. To step out of the current of the world and to let God change you. And so I wanna take you to an example that the apostle Paul may have had in mind as he's getting very practical about how it is we have the same mindset in all of our relationships as Jesus and almost certainly would have been thinking about this particular episode from Jesus' life, if not more episodes from Jesus' life. This happened on Thursday of the last week that Jesus was um, alive before his crucifixion and resurrection. Thursday was the night that the Jews from the Northern Kingdom celebrated the Passover. The Jews from the southern kingdom celebrated the Passover on Friday night. That's kind of weird, isn't it? That they had two different nights. It's just the way that they worked themselves out. And um, Jesus was under pressure. There were people wanting to kill him. People wanted to kill the disciples. They were not running for their lives, but they were looking over their shoulder. If it was a movie, the dramatic music would be playing. They'd be checking their six, making sure that they haven't been followed. When each one showed up to the upper room, they'd be like, hey, did anyone follow you? No. Did anybody see you come up here? Nope, I'm good. They got up to the upper room where they met for Jesus' last conversation with them before the events of, well, we celebrated at Easter and Good Friday before they happen. And they all got into the room and laid down to begin to partake of the meal. They realized that nobody had washed anyone's feet. Now, foot washing may be something you're unfamiliar with. Um, uh, Christians, we make it weird, right? Because we try to take a a, a subject, a, a habit, a custom from a day many, 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 many years ago where hygiene was not a thing. They didn't have showers. They didn't have baths. You didn't wake up in the morning and get clean with Dove soap or whatever beauty product you use. Um, You know, you just basically washed what you could, how you could. Baths were few and far between and people smell bad. And um, we, don't, we don't have any excuse to smell bad. If someone smells bad, then there's an omission of hygiene. But most of us have, have access to, to tools that make us not smell bad. But back in Jesus' day, um, you know, your feet would smell because you wore sandals, you walked on dusty roads. We don't do that. Um, and so when we talk about foot washing, especially people who aren't churchy, who didn't grow up in church, they have no idea what we're talking about. It seems weird. But it's a custom. It was a custom that represented uh, cleanliness. It also represented hospitality. And the servants who were around a meeting, in this case, they probably didn't have any servants for a couple reasons. One was they didn't want anybody to know they were there. And number two, they probably were just shifting sort of on the fly and didn't know where they were even going to end up, if you know the story about how the upper room was selected. So they got there and there was nobody there to wash their feet. Normally, it would have been the servants who would get together and they would draw straws and the one who drew the shortest straw would end up having to wash the feet because it was a nasty job, as you might imagine. I wouldn't want to wash your feet and you probably had a shower this morning. And that would not be as bad of an experience as somebody's grimy feet that are caked with dirt that hadn't had a shower in a long time. It's just not something you want to do. And so Jesus, as he got in there, um, the Bible says they were reclining at the table. And then all of a sudden, He realizes that nobody had washed anyone's feet. The disciples, nobody thought to do it. It was a huge omission. Luke chapter 22 tells us they were fighting amongst each other. 
They were um, arguing about who was going to be the best, who was going to be the greatest, who would have the best seat in heaven. And you may think that's the biggest bonehead thing you can do, right? But they just assumed that's what's, what, what was going to happen. They were faithful serving God. They were growing spiritually. They'd begin reading their Bible. Not really, but, you know, contextually, it would be sort of the same thing. They were learning how to pray. They'd seen some miracles. They were being obedient. They were growing and they got conceited and they compared themselves to each other and said, who's the closest to Jesus? Who's the best disciple? And, um, you know, it was a heartbreaking situation. So Jesus stands up rearranges his clothes, grabs a pot of water and begins washing the disciples' feet. Now, Peter says, forget it, not me, no way, you're not gonna wash my feet. And Jesus said, no, I, I have to wash your feet and explain to him that Jesus wasn't simply acting like God, that he was God, that he wasn't simply playing God, but that he was revealing who God really was and that Jesus had come to serve the world around him. Jesus, the most humble person ever to walk the face of the earth, the only person ever to live without a Messiah complex was the Messiah. And so he takes the towel in the basin and washes the feet of each of the disciples. And it was a moment that taught so much truth. But do you know how many words were exchanged? This many words. But you and I and churches and Christians throughout the years have been so full of words. But when our actions are evaluated, we fall short and we blame the truth we stand for. People just don't want the truth. They just don't wanna hear the truth about Jesus. And no, the reality is they just don't like us and they don't like the way we stand for the truth. And Jesus was teaching them, if you want influence, you want an audience, you want people to listen to this life-changing truth of the gospel, that if you confess your sin and believe who Jesus is and choose to follow him with your life, that you can become a child of God, then you've gotta be serious about it and you gotta live it. When he finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place and says, do you understand what I've done for you? He said, you call me teacher and you call me Lord and rightly so for that's what I am. Um, but he said, I teacher and Lord have washed your feet. So you go wash one another's feet. Now, I want to tell you again, he wasn't talking about feet. Sometimes we think, well, I'm going to go wash somebody's feet. Fine, if you want to wash their feet, wash their feet. What he's talking about is the principle that exists behind the custom of the day. And the reason he chose foot washing was because it was contextual to a time and a place. But the principle continues today. And he said, now I, your master and teacher, have served you and shown you what love looks like. You should do as I have done for you. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So the ones that Jesus called closest to him, he demonstrated love and sent them out and said, you go and do these things. You and I are taught to live the exact same way. In 1 John, there's a passage of scripture that tells us that we are, or sorry, John chapter two, <laughs> verse four through six, we are intended to live like Jesus. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him, must live the way Jesus lived. Sounds a little bit like what Paul taught, doesn't it? So I go all the way back to how we started. In your relationships with everyone, with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus. And you look at me and you go, sounds good, preacher, but how are we gonna do that? And I get it. And I'll tell you, part of it 
is the Holy Spirit of God transforming you and me in our spirit and helping us think a different way. But going all the way back to week one in Romans chapter 12, verse one and two, part of it is you and I intentionally stepping out of the current of the world, putting ourselves in that current of the spirit so that we can be transformed. And there are some things that you can do that are just like Jesus. And all you need is to be disciplined, just a little. It'll make a world of difference. And I'm gonna tell you what those things are in just a minute when we come back after we sing. All right, you ready to be freed from the tiny little room we call a universe that we have created for ourselves where there's only room in there for us to exist or anyone else in our lives who helps us get what we want or become who we wanna be? That's a big question, but you can be freed today from self. You can begin the process of becoming self-aware, of becoming others focused, of making spiritual progress. And that's what I want for you today. And I know that many of you will try this and I've been praying for you already um, because I know personally firsthand what can happen in my life. So I know what can happen in your life when I just do something little over time consistently applied in the right place, the difference it can make in my own heart and in the relationships around me. Fast forward a little bit to the last really part of that Thursday evening, maybe early Friday morning where Jesus was with his disciples. An intense time hiding out in the upper room. Minutes, hours before Jesus was betrayed in the garden and arrested, he prays a prayer. All one continuous evening, this John 13 through John 17. But in John 17, he prays a prayer. And I think this prayer it contributes to this idea of, in all our relationships, have the same mindset as Jesus. In all of our relationships, serve and love the people around us to be able to gain influence in their life, serve and love so that we can finish well. In John 17, we see that Jesus is praying and he says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of this world. I wanna stop there for just a second because this is where we begin to get very practical. Jesus is praying to God the Father. Jesus is Jesus Christ the Son, 100% God, 100% man who came to earth to live a perfect life. And he's praying to God the Father at the end of his earthly life. And he says something really revealing that I've skipped so many times. He said, I have revealed you, God, to those who you have given me. Now, what do you want out of your life? If you're a believer, a Christian, what you want is you wanna be able to get to the end of your mission and to be able to say, I have revealed you, God, to the ones who you have given me. Now, this also answers some questions for me, like why did Jesus heal some and not heal others? Because he walked past hundreds or thousands who might've needed healing and yet chose for whatever reason not to heal. He spoke to some crowds and not to others. He engaged and embraced some, but yet seemed to bypass others. He selected 12, but there were dozens and dozens who probably wanted the job because God the Father had given him people in his life who he took responsibility for. And the other ones, they were for somebody else. Now his message was for everyone, but his engagement was in for the people who God the Father had put in his life. God pointed him toward the 12, led him through his life, just like God has put people in your life, the people he's given you. Some you would choose and some you may not. They were yours, you gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know everything you've given me comes from you. What do you want your friends to know? What do you want your coworkers to know? What do you want your siblings to know? What do you want your parents to know? The people who you have come in contact with in this world, in your lifetime, you want them to know that everything good that you have 
has come from God. The rest we did to ourselves, right? But you want that. And Jesus said, they know. I've revealed you to them. And he did it through words, but he also did it with a towel and a basin, an embrace, eye contact. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you've given me, for they are yours. I have revealed to you, to those people you gave me. Now they know everything I have. Everything good has come from you. So you have people who God has given you. Here's where you really have to start listening and paying attention, okay? This is the take home. It's not everything, it's a start. I promise you, as I apply this to my life, not only did God use it to help Joy and I start some churches where we didn't know anybody in the towns that we moved to, but it's changed, first of all, the way I view the world around me. And secondly, it's improved the quality of relationships that I have with people who God has given me. Who are the people that God has given you? Who are the people in your life? How are you going to reveal the truth about God to them so that they know every good thing comes from him. Maybe you have some excuses built in. I wrote some down last night. They're not in your notes because the notes were long since in the can uh, on the computer uh, and I just was going through these. Maybe there's some excuses you have to living your life this way. One, um, no one's done this for me, so why should I do it for someone else? Well, you can be a cycle breaker or a cycle partaker and you may have the ability to stop generations of self-centeredness, a me first mindset and change everything for your kids and grandkids and the generations to come. I'm not wired that way. It's just not how I think. I wanna tell you a story about a guy who I worked with a long time ago. I was the pastor of a church. We had a school. And the school had a headmaster and um, the headmaster was a great guy. He was a believer, he was a Christian school. He walked with God, he was a good friend. People didn't like him. They did not like him. When I got to the church, first thing I did was sit down with every single teacher, gave them a half hour, listened to what they had to say about the school, the church, everything else, you know, that's what you do in your first 90 days. And they complained about him. They said, we don't like this guy. We don't like this guy. We don't know him. He doesn't talk to us. I'm like, man, he's a great guy. He has great things to share. He loves the Lord, but they hated his guts. So I met with him and I'm like, what's up? And he goes, I don't know. He said, I like them. Well, they don't like you. Why don't they like you? Well, I'm not very relational. I'm just not wired that way. And I said, man, these are the people. Now, if it was one or two, you got a problem, right? But I mean, 36, I mean, we're talking about a trend here, right? We got a problem. Just because you're not wired that way, right? You don't have to be motivated or even that relational as long as you're disciplined. So I said, we're gonna fix it. I need the great guy in you to come out. I'm tired of your intentions being different than your actions and people don't know who you are. So I said, on odd days, you're gonna go walk down the hall. So on the left-hand side of the hall, you're gonna stop by every classroom and you're gonna ask the teacher these questions. And I handed him a note card with questions on it to help him be relational because he wasn't wired that way, but he was gonna be intentional and he was good at the intentionality. And I said, on the even days, you go down the hall and you talk to the teachers on the right side and you ask them these questions. And in 90 days, I went back and I talked to the teachers again. Not just about that, but that was one of the things and every single, well, almost every single one of them had a totally different opinion about him. And he was the same guy. But the way that he related to the world around him had totally shifted. And do you know what he had gained? Influence. So I don't care how you're wired. It makes it more challenging for some of us. But what I'm looking for is a little bit of discipline. I got a couple more. I'm gonna try to move fast here. 
Um, I'm not responsible for anyone else but me. Lie. I'm not responsible for anyone but me. Lie. Now, you may not know it's a lie, but it's a lie straight from Satan. I'm only responsible for myself. Lie. What if Jesus had said that? I'm not responsible for anybody but me. Good luck. Well, I'm going to stand for the truth and I'm going to throw you a Bible down over the edge of heaven and whoever it hits can come join me when you die. Wouldn't that be a terrible way for us to have to become Christians? But we say that I'm not responsible for anyone else. Lie. It's not true. It's too late. That ship has sailed. How do you know? A conclusion is the last thought you think when you're done thinking. It's the period you put at the end of the sentence and you may have ruined some relationships, but who knows? Can they be undone through the power of the Holy Spirit? Your heart softening, you building a bridge? I believe they can. I have a hard time sticking with things. I'm not really that consistent of a person. And as I've said to you twice already and now for the third time or the fourth time, you don't have to have motivation as long as you have discipline. So here's what I want you to do. You have a sheet, a, well, mini worksheet and some explanation and your notes on the app. If you don't have that, if you log on by Facebook, people watching online, there'll be a link to this so that you can get it and kind of see what I'm thinking. This didn't come from scripture, this part. This is based on biblical principles. It's what I do in my life, what Joy and I do, and it changes me and helps the Holy Spirit put this stuff in here and everything is different in me and in the world around me. Who are the people God's put in your life? I would suggest that you choose four to six. Now, these might be a spouse. I would say should be a spouse if you're married. And the reason that I want you to start with your spouse is because we are responsible for the people closest to us first. And so many people who think it's their job to legislate morality for the world and are so busy being in everybody else's business when you drill down, they have the worst relationships, the least influence with the people who know them the best. And that's something that we have to change. And it's hard to love the person who sees you every day and even harder for them to love you. So I'd say your spouse probably would be on that list. If you have adult kids out of the home, they ought to be on that list. If you have kids in the home, they're on every list, right? They're your life. I mean, you got, that's a different kind of thing, right? You can't do this with your kids at home. You're supposed to do everything for your kids at home. But parenting doesn't stop when they turn 18 and leave the home. You want to have a relationship with your kids after they don't have to be your friend anymore. When they don't need anything from you, I hope you as much as I want to have a relationship with them. And I want my influence with them to grow as I age. And for me to be that old man that not everybody talks about because we're so obnoxious, standing for the truth, right? That the way we stand for the truth alienates everyone in our life who we say we care about. And nobody wants your opinion. They don't wanna hear about your Jesus in some cases don't even wanna be around. So I think if you have adult children, they'd likely be on that list. Now you're not responsible for making them love you and you can't control whether or not they choose to have a relationship with you, but you can try. A parent may be on this list. I believe that when a child leaves the home, they leave and cleave and form a new family and a parent no longer controls the child that the child is responsible for creating their own family and the parent is now a complement to that family and does what they can to love and encourage that family to be a part of it, but they're no longer the center. They pass on the center to the kids as they get married and move on. There's a time when parents can no longer have their own lives and relationships like they used to and may very well need to be on your list. But we as parents, even as we age, we are doers, we're not takers but your parents may need to be on your list. Your friends, your close friends, there may be one who you think should be on your list. If you're a boss, maybe it's somebody who works for you. If you're an employee, maybe somebody who you work for, maybe a coworker. 
maybe a close friend and you've never really talked about the God thing, right? But you just know you ought to because you love them, but you just hadn't gotten around to, you know, I don't know if I'm responsible for them and it would be weird and maybe it's one of them. I think there ought to be somebody who doesn't know Jesus on your list. There was somebody who didn't know Jesus on Jesus' list. And by the way, none of his disciples were Christians when he called them. Every single one of them came to understand the truth of Jesus by living with him in relationship over three years. Nothing good happens in a hurry. Our problem is we want to fly in, drop truth bombs and fly off. They just don't like the Bible. No, they don't like you. The message lands from a soft heart to a heart that's softening through an intentional relationship that's developed over time. Pray about your list. I think four is minimum. And even the loneliest person, the person who's going through a patch where there are not that many people around, and that happens to everyone from time to time, would have four people, either family, friends, coworkers, four people who God would put in your life. I have six that are on this list and six works well for me, but select your list and select it well. Now, step number two, just walk with me, all right? Just humor me. Number two, after you get your list together, after you've identified your list, then I want you to schedule consistently a way for you to reach out and touch them in a meaningful way. You go, I don't know, that sounds kind of weird. No, it's not. It's called intentional. Well, I don't know about that. Hear me out. Your iPhone is your best friend. I set out this week to find an app for you that would make it easier for you. I can't find an app better than your calendar on your iPhone. If you're an Android person, I got no hope for you anyway. So you're just on your own. Go to your Android community and ask them, no, I'm teasing with you. I'm sure the, the calendar works the same way. Um, I have no hate, just uh, curiosity about you Android folks. That's all. I don't know the other, the other half, how they live, the other 10%. If you have an iPhone on your calendar, it's just, it's so easy. And this is what I want you to do. Now, four people, I think is a minimum because you need a rotation. You don't identify your people and then tell them that they're on your list, by the way. You don't go to your adult child and go, you're on my list. I'm going to love you intentionally and your heart is gonna soften toward me. I'm gonna gain influence with you. You don't do that. That's creepy and, and again, it's a little strange. You just put them on your list and you begin to influence them, but you schedule them, right? You don't tell them what's going on. And you put in your, your calendar, you open up your calendar app and, and you write a name, Richard. And you set an appointment. And right there in the app on your calendar, it gives you a couple tools that are really important. Now I have six, I wanna do this once a week. I want you doing this once a week from now until the end of 2024, 10 months. It's a lot to ask, but I promise you it'll be worth it. Richard, set an appointment, a reminder, recurring, Reminder, there's a little tab for that. How often? Every six weeks. When do I want to be reminded about the appointment? One week before my appointment. Then when do I want my second reminder? Two days before my appointment. And so on a Monday, I'll have a notice that pops up on my iPhone that reminds me to reach out in a meaningful way to somebody on my list. Richard, my oldest son. I've been reminded two days before and one week before, and I know that my job is to reach out and to do something for him that hopefully I've thought through that lets him know I love him and that serves him in some way. Now we're gonna talk a lot about this in a Bible study that we're gonna have on Wednesday evenings, beginning the Wednesday immediately following Easter for three weeks. This will be one of the sessions that we talk about and I'm gonna drill down and just give you ideas and let you know how it's worked and not worked and whatever. But right now, I just you know, want you to bear with me. Based on the love languages that you know, Gary Smalley invented in 1992, there are just three of them that I rotate between. And every six weeks when his name pops up, I will have either found something for him that I purchased and have sent to him, and don't think about expense, because it's not about expense, it's about thoughtfulness, 
Instagram, if you're on Instagram, they say all kinds of stuff they try to sell you. It take, comes from China a lot of times, so it takes a long time to get here. You got to plan in advance. But I'll see something, and I'm like, you know who would love that? And so I'll order it. And then the next six weeks, it's not the same thing. When his name pops up, a word of encouragement is my goal for him for that week. So I'll send a text, write a handwritten note, have a phone conversation, and I'll try to say something to him that's meaningful, that's encouraging, that's significant, and that builds him up. And I have six people. So every six weeks, I reach out to one person on my list, which means that every week, for six weeks, I have a different person. Now, you schedule and you schedule it consistently and your phone will remind you how to be spontaneous and to reach out and to be thoughtful and to change the perception of you, to let what's inside begin to come out. And then when you contact them, you contact them creatively. You look for opportunities, maybe even pray for them. And you find that your heart changes because you begin to view the world, not just according to your list, but according to the people around you. And you begin to think in terms of words of encouragement, an act of service if you're close enough to be able to do that, or something perhaps that you've been able to buy and to give. You become a person who picks up the towel every week, who loves and serves the world around us, beginning with the people who Jesus gave us so that our words will have a place to land. And that as we age, our influence will grow and we can get to the end of our lives and we can say to God the Father, I have done my best to reveal you to the people who you've given me. And as best I can, flawed and all, I've let them know that everything good in me has come from you. And feeling it and thinking it is not enough. We have to do it. And this is a way. So I would ask you, don't say it doesn't work unless you, or until you try it and then try it. Okay, this is the last one. And this is extra credit. After you've done this for a while, and don't you hate getting advice from somebody who when they start something, they're all excited about it and they tell you how to diet or they tell you how to, you know, it's like, come on, you do this for a while, then you tell me and then I'll listen to you. So after you've done this for a while, after you've earned some credibility, perhaps three months, six months into it, when you begin to see your heart soften, you begin to see your relationships. And by the way, we record, Joy and I do, and the notes on our phone down at the bottom, how these things land, what worked, what didn't work, things we're gonna do next time. We observe really carefully and we, you know, we, we record these things. Joy and I do it together. We have a great time doing it together. She's more creative than I am and so it helps sometimes for me, we do it together. But anyway, extra credit. The very end, after you've had three months, six months, whatever, you have people in your life who have broken relationships, who feel like there's too much water under the bridge with their family, with their friends who feel things but just can't quite get them out, who are relational, but they're just so um, out there, such flibberty gibbets that nothing ever really gets done because they're here and they're there. And, and, and you're like, look, I can help. Here's something that's just a super easy tool that if applied over time can change your life. No, it's not everything. There's more, of course there's more, but it's something. And you share with them what it is that, that you've done out of humility because after all, we're such self-centered people, we have to schedule this, right? But we do. And you offer it to them like I'm offering it to you. And say, do you wanna see your closest relationships restored or grow? Do you want your words to be able to land when you choose to share the truth of your Lord and Savior, Jesus? Do you wanna age without regret and die knowing that you've done your best? Let me offer you something. 
Not everything, but something. So don't say yes or no, because I don't want to be demoralized or disillusioned. You're thinking about it. You're thinking it over online here. But my rhetorical question is, are you going to give it a shot? And if you do, will you do me a favor? Will you let me know? Let me know how it's going. Because I want to encourage you, but I also want to be encouraged because we're in this together. Remember, nobody wins unless we all win. We compare ourselves to Jesus and all of us together, hand in hand, are growing to become more like him. The beginning of the attitude of service, a humble and Christ-like heart. Father, thank you so much for the time we've spent together. And I pray that as we close this time, that something as simple as this, as practical as this wouldn't be overlooked. It seems insignificant spiritually, but something reveals a heart of compassion, a heart of care, of concern, something that provides an inroad, a way for your Holy Spirit to transform us into new people, for us to step out of the current of selfishness and into the current of the world or out of the world into the current of the spirit, something tangible each week that lets you know we're willing to put on the towel so that our hearts are ready for more as you show us and when you show us and as we grow. So I pray, Father, that as we continue this series that we are building lives, installing things into our lives that will let you do great things for your glory alone and because of Jesus. I love my friends, Father, and I know how hard it is to live for you, to die to self. And I know how hard they're trying, but you love them far more than I do. And you're not going to allow us to fail as long as we keep going. You're gonna complete in us what you began because you promised us that in your word. And so I thank you for that. You're greater than anything we face in this world. And it's with that confidence and because of who Jesus is that I pray these things in his name, amen. Stand with me, please. Let's sing this last.